Well, it's good to be at Heartland. I was uh, thinking uh, the last time uh, we were here was uh, 19 years ago uh, in 2002, and this was the first talk I gave after my father's um, uh, shocking death uh, that occurred. And uh, it was hard for me to speak on some of the topics, uh, having just lost my father that uh, was uh, so much of my success in life uh, is credited to him. Uh, he was a great man and uh, loved the Lord. Uh, and I couldn't have asked for a, a more ideal or better father. I know that puts me at an advantage in so many ways. Studies show that if you have a, a loving, authoritative father, you're far more likely to succeed in life, and you're far more likely to be able to solve your own problems as well. Uh, and you're also uh, nine times less likely not to go to jail uh, you're more likely it, when you marry to stay with the same woman throughout life. There is so much, uh, so many positive things that come from a loving, authoritative father. But we're seeing loving, authoritative fathers on a rapid decline in this country. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing the deterioration of so many aspects of America uh, is because of the absence of loving, authoritative fathers. So uh, that is um, uh, certainly in my memory uh, in the last time I was here. The first time, which was, um, uh, that would have been 1994, I think I spoke at a convocation here. Uh, and uh, that was probably four or five years, at, four years after our book, um, well, no. I don't think the, the book Proof Positive had come out yet. I think it was just in the process of being written uh, at that time. But, uh, you know, there's quite a connection between Weimar and Heartland. I don't know how many of you are, are aware of the history, but uh, I wonder if there were never problems at Weimar if Heartland would even exist. There were two uh, very famous, beloved individuals who were at Weimar College shortly after it had formed in the um, late 70s, early 80s. The academic dean of Weimar College, you might have heard of, his name was Colin Standish. And the chaplain, I will not name, but the chaplain was very popular, probably even more popular than Colin Standish. And uh, there was division. I didn't realize this till after I came to Weimar and began to look at the, the documents. And instead of causing a split campus, Colin decided to leave and start another institute <laughs> with the help of others called Heartland College. Uh, he was our, our uh, academic dean and it actually come from being the academic dean of a place close by here. Uh, at that time, it was called Columbia Union College, uh, but later was uh, called Washington Adventist University. And so he was academic dean there and then came to Weimar and then back out and started uh, this institution along with others, um, Heartland Institute. It turns out when I look at what the disagreements were, Colin was actually right. <laughs> It had to do with theology, and it had to do with biblical Adventism, and he could see where things were leading in regards to the chaplain's theology. And sure enough, he was right. That chaplain only lasted a few more years, and he ended up having problems with women, having problems with alcohol, left the church entirely, and became a devout atheist is still alive and still tries to communicate with his former Weimar students. And uh, their sites set up and, uh, and uh, it actually encourages them uh, to go the direction that he went. 
It's very uh, difficult uh, at times uh, because he was so popular at that time and so loved by the students and others uh, to, um, uh, you know, to, to see the, um, where this pathway has led him. But, uh, you know, sometimes these divisions can be for the good. And uh, now, uh, of course, we have Heartland that's been in existence for many years and I know has done a lot of good um, uh, throughout the world. And, of course, Weimar uh, uh, continued to shrink um, and collapse. And in 2008, the college closed. Uh, the academy was going to close the next year. And uh, that's when uh, Amazing Facts took over a management agreement on the basis that I would come out and be president. <laughs> and so uh, we've been there since 2008. But uh, with the help of the Lord, uh, Weimar is transformed. As you know, the college is, uh, was only closed for about six months, or, and then the academy never did close. And uh, now uh, Weimar is growing and flourishing. We have a new problem at Weimar. We are way out of space, and we have, you know, uh, packed dorm space. And uh, we had a, a problem that the Lord helped us solve. We were starting a master's program. Weimar is, is now Weimar University. We have three different master's programs, plus undergraduate programs. And um, our, uh, the master's program that we just had approved uh, was called, uh, it's a master's in religion in mission and wellness. It's particularly um, designed to help those who go through that master's to know how to revitalize and to plant new churches. And uh, the first um, uh, nine months or so is very didactic in learning the discipling method of Christ's threefold ministry, and then the last year and a half is all practical based. And um, uh, we have 10 different uh, professors uh, led by Dr. Paul Ratsara, who was the division president of South Africa Indian Ocean Division when it um, became the most populous Adventist division. In fact, I've been to Africa in his division when he was there and uh, what I noticed, and a lot of people notice this, in every, almost every city of the world, you'll see three things. You'll see a Catholic church, an Adventist church, and a McDonald's. <laughs> and uh, in, in most places uh, that I've been in America, you'll see a big Catholic church and a smaller Adventist church. But in Africa, uh, throughout that entire division, you drive into town and it's a huge Adventist church and only a small Catholic church, and the McDonald's is still there. Uh, and so uh, those are the, the, the universal aspects uh, that are there around the globe. But uh, he grew that division through the threefold ministry. He loves the, utilizing the health message, and I've worked with him uh, in those countries over there doing a health programming for the the parliaments and for the presidents and for the governors. And um, he is heading up a team of 10. But we could only market the program uh, after we got approved. And our accreditor uh, has to approve uh, each of the programs. We have to go through it all. And uh, they approved uh, this program five weeks before school was to start. And our CFO says, we're not starting this year until you have 12 students. You know, one of the things that uh, Weimar board uh, makes me follow, it's a thou shalt not. As president of Weimar, one of the thou shalt nots is thou shalt not spend more money than what you take in. And so every, uh, everything has to be paid for. And so in order for this master's program to be paid for, we needed 12 students. And uh, Paul Ratsara was very much like Jesus. He scoured uh, the world and he came up with 12 uh, apostles, uh, so to speak, that are willing to be trained by these 10. Uh, and in five weeks, they were there. Many of them dropped their job. One of them is a, a physician and, uh, from Germany, and he lost. He, he was even going to lose his license because you can't quit practicing 
you, and he didn't even know whether he was going to lose his license or not. He came over and it was, he appealed to be able to keep his license and they, after he arrived, three weeks after school started, uh, they said that he could keep his license uh, as long as he goes back to Germany, so he's going to be. And we have uh, 12 from all over the world, actually 16, there ended up being 16 uh, in the program, but there was no place to put them. All of the housing was packed, all of the dorms were packed, and these were master's students that some of them had children, many of them had wives. Uh, no places like that, you can't just live in a dorm, plus all the dorm space was filled from the undergraduate program. We had been putting up a staff housing complex um, that was taking some time, but uh, in part because we have a very um, strict county that um, has all of these rules and regulations. Um, sometimes California is called uh, Commu-fornia uh, because of all the rules and regulations that are similar to communism uh, and, uh, and, and that progressive side of things. And so it's a beautiful state to be in, but a lot of people are leaving it because of the politics, as you might know. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, with all those rules and regulations, they had denied us being able to have occupancy. We had to fill out, do pages of things. There are all sorts of things uh, that, that had to be uniquely done differently. But fortunately, five days before the school was to start, the county approved it and said, you are ready for occupancy. And of course, we couldn't even put all the furniture and beds in. So in five days, we were just, <laughs> uh, my wife was spending uh, uh, a large portion of her day in Ikea. Uh, and then uh, we were having to construct all this furniture and beds. But the 16 had a place to live now, along with their children. And uh, it's actually called, um, we actually just had a, um, a grand opening of the building. Uh, the first memorial uh, to John Tyndall, the great threefold evangelist uh, that um, was actually the mentor of Pastor Mark Finley. And since uh, there was no monument to him anywhere in the world, Mark Finley came over and talked about John Tyndall uh, as we expand this threefold ministry. So um, exciting things I know happening in both campuses, and I just learned in coming here that one of your recent graduates is going to be entering one of our other master's uh, programs. So um, hopefully um, some of you Heartland students will think about Weimar for your graduate studies. I know this is a great place to be here for your undergraduate studies, but uh, for your graduate studies, um, she'll be taking the, um, uh, the master's in counseling and wellness. And that's another miracle story, how we got approved even under a progressive uh, political state to actually have our graduates sit for the, the board exam for a, a, being a licensed counselor, either in marriage, fam marriage and family or other uh, places. And we made it abundantly clear that we are unapologetically biblical and uncompromisingly scientific. And despite the unapologetically biblical aspect of things, we still got approved. Uh, and our, uh, our students can still uh, sit for their license board exam. In fact, I think it would be um, uh, worthwhile uh, for me to, to quote, seeing that we're uh, from one educational institution to another. Uh, this is what I actually gave yesterday in our, in our staff meeting. And I may not be able to pull it up, but I can paraphrase it. Uh, well, maybe I will be able to pull it up here. Uh, yes. You know, Martin Luther, when he was committing his life to the Lord in this monastic environment, he came across a Bible that was chained to the wall of the monastery in a hallway. And when he read that Bible, as he started reading it, he was just filled with the sacred messages from God. He said, I wish I could have one of these myself. This is so impressive that I'm reading the word of God. 
And upon reading it and studying it, he began to realize that this word was not being carried out uh, very well, even among the church and the major churches. And as he studied it more, he began to realize the church needed reform. And his attempts to reform the church were not successful, and it wasn't his desire to start a new church, but that's where the Lutheran church came from. But uh, shortly after he had uh, left Rome, he was studying at the University of Wittenberg. I've had the opportunity to, to actually lecture there. Also at the university, there's another university where Dr. Alzheimer comes from in Germany, and it's also where Pope Benedict did his education. I've had the opportunity to speak there as well. Uh, but um, he got his doctorate of divinity, and he said, now I am so glad I'm through with this because I can study the Bible more. <laughs> and he wrote this shortly after this because he had been at the universities getting the highest degrees. I am much afraid that the universities will prove to be the great gates of hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the Holy Scriptures and engraving them in the hearts of youth. I advise no one to place his child where the Scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution in which men are not unceasingly occupied with the Word of God must become corrupt. And so we see the corruption of universities. Many universities were formed, including Harvard, on unapologetically biblical principles, as well as uncompromisingly scientific principles. But there's very few universities left uh, in that category. Science has reigned supreme, so-called science. Paul says, when we don't have the word of God to guide science, science is going to end up being falsely so-called, because it's actually going to be erroneous. <laughs> it's not going to be accurate, and it's going to be misleading. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, I know Hartland's uh, desire as well is to stay unapologetically biblical and uncompromisingly scientific. And so I know you're, um, for the students and faculty, it's a privilege and honor to be here uh, and study in this environment. And by the way, that's where academic freedom comes from. A lot of the teachers here would not be able to have academic freedom at another university to be able to teach the principles of God's love and law. Well, today we're going to be discussing, uh, I had to look uh, on the car ride over. By the way, your traffic was worse here than it was in Northern California. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I was coming into Dulles, I was just amazed at the beautiful uh, scenery that I was flying just a few feet over, all this farmland and beautiful rivers and, and uh, uh, streams and all of these beautiful meadows and, and uh, uh, crops and then beautiful trees. And I'm thinking, this is a nice rural airport I'm flying into. And uh, then off the highway, it looked like I was seeing a lot of that beautiful greenery, but the highways were packed. <laughs> and uh, at a snail's pace, so I'm glad I made it here tonight. Uh, but um, this aspect of suicide is actually, uh, both suicide as well as suicidal thoughts are dramatically increasing. Gallup poll of Americans during COVID, American state COVID is adversely affecting their mental health even worse than its effects physically or financially. Emotional well-being is being attacked at a stronger rate than ever before in human history, said Gallup. Now, I am quoting Gallup. It's not that I believe that statement, um, but Gallup didn't clarify. They should have. They should have put being attacked at a stronger rate than ever before in human history since Gallup has been analyzing it. Uh, but 11% uh, of the population considered taking their own life in 2020. That's higher than ever before. Over one out of 10 individuals seriously contemplating taking their own life last year. A report came out of the military just this last week showing four times as many people have died from suicides in the military than combat deaths since 2001. 
And since 2001, every year we've seen a steady increase in suicide, even when the economy was up at the all-time high. Normally suicides go down, but suicides continue to go up despite a high economy. And we know when the economy goes down, it tends to be even more. And just this week, the University of North Carolina closed their university due to the large number of suicides on campus. And uh, this is uh, going on, on a number of different campuses. At Weimar, we run the Depression and Anxiety Recovery Program. That's, we have two buildings to run health, residential health programs at Weimar. We have the New Start Lodge, which is for the physical health issues, diabetes, uh, cancer, heart disease, uh, similar to, I'm sure, the, um, the Heartland Health programs. And then uh, we have a separate building concurrently where there, we are renting the, the, uh, running the mental health residential program. And uh, normally we accept 20 in every program. Uh, we've been doing this program. Uh, it started in Oklahoma back in 2002. So uh, this is our 20th year uh, in doing it, and we've seen some significant differences. We used to have maybe two or three people uh, come in with suicidal thoughts but, uh, or have actively come out of attempting to end their life. But now we see uh, much uh, more. You can see here this was nine in the um, last uh, program that we have the uh, data for here. And uh, when they're at the top, that means they're thinking about it every day. They're wanting to end their life every day before they come to the program. When they're in the middle there, that's half of the time they're contemplating suicide, about half of every day uh, for the two weeks before they came. And then if they're down there at the bottom, that's a quarter of the time. Now the rest of them have suicide or, or depression or anxiety, but not contemplating suicide. And uh, you can see in just 10 days, these thoughts are completely gone in eight out of nine. Uh, one of them uh, still had some. Normally, if we have some, we recommend uh, they stay longer, although that's not what's done in a psych institution. In a psych institution, a traditional psych institution, they know they can't get rid of those thoughts. And so what do they do? They do what's called safety plans. In other words, instead of ending your life, what else can you do to help yourself cope with these emotions? And so the counselors are taught about safety plans. I'm sure we'll, talk, we'll teach about safety plans in our master's program as well, and how to do that utilizing cognitive behavioral therapy. But far better than safety plans is when the thoughts are completely gone and not even on the radar screen. And uh, this is something that can occur in a relatively short period of time in a comprehensive approach. So, our average for those that come in with suicidal thoughts is uh, they're thinking about it half the time and the average at the end of the program uh, shows a well over a 90% uh, reduction, 95% reduction uh, in that. And, uh, and once again, if they're not uh, reduced, then we keep them longer. It's a 10-day program, but they can stay 17, 24 days as long as it takes for those brains to change and for those thoughts to become more rational and healthier. But you know, with suicide as well as other important decisions in life, there's a hymn um, that has these words to it, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. And uh, this often, uh, the, when important decisions are made, the person doesn't even realize how important it is. So I'd like you to open your Bibles. We're going to be talking about suicide in the Bible. This is not just a modern topic. There are, depending on how you look at it, six or seven suicides in the Bible. I'm going to say six, although some will say seven. We won't get to all of them tonight. I'm going to be dealing with a couple of them uh, tomorrow. Um, but I want to deal with someone who actually we don't have the record that he committed suicide, but we certainly have the record that he wanted to on more than one occasion. So I'd like to, you to open your Bibles to the book of Jonah. 
Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Jonah was a prophet. The Lord communicated with him audibly, directly, and he was known to be a true prophet. Prior to this, he had prophesied something that was thought not to be, to be very unlikely to occur, and it's actually recorded in Kings that it did occur. Everything that he said would happen came to pass, indicating that God was with him and had communicated with him. And so now, now God communicates with him again <clears throat> and tells him that Nineveh's wickedness is so bad that it's time for their destruction. But before it's destroyed, there needs to be a warning. Verse 3 says, Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. And what does your Bible say? He was trying to get away from what the Lord was telling him to do and even trying to get away from his presence. Now we might not understand why Jonah was so insistent in not following the Lord's will. Sometimes the Lord tells us to do something that we actually don't want to do. And often that can come up because of our human natures. God says to do this, but we want to do that. And it's pretty clear when you go through Jonah that he had some issues with Nineveh. The people of Nineveh had likely enslaved relatives of his, likely had robbed them, likely had even murdered them. Nineveh and the surrounding areas had a history of anti-Semitism. By the way, where do we get that name? Anti-Semitism. What's the actual Sem. That's actually Shem. Uh, and so that's where the name comes from. These are descendants of Shem. And of course, Israel or Jacob, Abraham was a descendant of, of Shem. So anti, anti Semitism is really based on the history of the uh, three sons of Noah. And, uh, and so there was a lot of pain that had occurred to those that Jonah had at least known about and probably knew personally as a result of the wickedness. And he's thinking, God, just destroy it. Don't send me there. Was there a reason for him to fear? There was. These were wicked people. These were a murderous lot. And you go down there and you tell them the truth and you take your life in your hands. Do you think we're getting to that point today? Yes. Where if you go somewhere and you tell the truth, you might actually be killed for it? We are entering into a new phase in America. America was actually founded by people who came here so that they could tell the truth and still live a safe life and have freedom of speech and freedom of religion. And we're living in a state where the person wrote the most extensive laws, Thomas Jefferson, a Virginian, on religious freedom and freedom of speech. He believed firmly in that. I think we'll need to be learning Thomas Jefferson's words and quoting them more frequently. As, the, as religious persecution starts to come about. But there's one group that you can say things against in a very hateful way, 
in America right now, and it's against biblical Christians, and you can completely get by with it, and you're completely safe. <laughs> but not so uh, in, in regards to uh, telling the truth about other groups. And so Jonah was fearful for his life. He was also thinking some of these people might heed the warning and get out of here and be saved, and I'm not sure I want any of them <laughs> to be alive. And so he goes the opposite direction. Nineveh was south, and Tarshish, he's going north. The Lord hurled a great wind, verse 4, upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so the ship threatened to break up. Verse 5, then the mariners were afraid. Each cried out to his God. They hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and laid down and was what? Fast asleep. How could he be asleep with this tremendous storm that was going on? One of the symptoms of severe depression is hypersomnia. You can get insomnia, and you can also get hypersomnia. Hypersomnia is when you want to sleep all the time. We've had people come to our program who are sleeping 20 hours a day. They're barely awake long enough to survive and to eat and to be able to um, uh, stay clean enough to survive. And when they are awake, we had one woman <laughs> come who was sleeping 20 hours a day and the four hours that she was awake three of those she was directing her family from her bed she was on, actually only out of bed for about an hour a day and and so uh, it's clear that Jonah had this hypersomnia I also think with the ship about ready to pull apart he might have actually awakened but he was so depressed it's like he didn't care. And you know, have you ever been so despondent that all you wanted to do was hide in a dark room and isolate yourself from other people? Have you ever been so depressed that all you could do was sleep? Or have you been so hurt by what others have done to you or those that you love that you find yourself hoping that bad things happen to them? This is a sign that there's a problem when we are hoping that bad things happen to our enemies. And have you ever dipped so far down that you no longer cared about your life or the safety of others? If you answer yes to any of those questions, then you can relate to Jonah. The book of Jonah continues. The captain searching around, found him down there and said, what do you mean, you sleeper? In other words, how in the world can you be sleeping through this? <laughs> Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. They said one to another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they start asking him questions. They said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? <coughs> Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he says, his answer is pretty interesting. Here he is running away from God doing exactly the opposite of what God wants him to do. But when they ask him these questions, he says, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. You know, I think it's hard to truthfully say we are worshiping the Lord when we are in open disobedience to him.
But you know, this can also apply to us. You may be reading the Bible, singing songs of praise, attending services. But if you're just going through the motions, you're not truly worshiping God. Obeying him would include allowing him to live in your life and empowering you to live the life the Bible outlines. And this also involves sharing his love to who? Sharing his love to others. This is something that is part of what we will do when we are truly worshiping and following God's will in our life. If we know what should be done, but are not, fear is present. And it's a sign that we need to understand God's love more. Because we're told that perfect love casts out what? It casts out fear. And Paul said, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Of love. And of a sound mind. The story goes on. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? And the sea grew more and more tempestuous. They didn't want to do what he was about ready to ask them to do. But it was an extreme situation. So Jonah said, pick me up, hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it's because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. That tells us that even though Jonah was a prophet and God communicated with him, Jonah's understanding of God was not complete. Jonah had not yet experienced God's mercy and forgiveness. Jonah saw the storm as a punishment instead of being sent by a loving God who valued Jonah and did not want him to run away from him. This is what happens. People come to depression and anxiety recovery. We ask them these questions. Do you think you're being punished? The vast majority say, yes, I'm being punished. But that's because they don't understand the loving God. God usually has not put them in those situations. But God has allowed it has not intervened for them because he wants them to turn around. He wants to lead them to repentance. By the way, if God was just interested in Nineveh and was utilizing Jonah to accomplish what he wanted for Nineveh, he would have just found somebody else to go over there and do it. So this wasn't just God's love for Nineveh. He loved Jonah. And in this state of depression, without faith in a loving God, Jonah becomes what? What would you put in that blank? Becomes suicidal. And he asks for assisted suicide. (laughs) Apparently he couldn't jump out of there himself. Uh, because of the way the boat was built, so he asked for their assistance for him to commit suicide. You might be experiencing a tempest in your life, and it might be in part due to the choices you have made. But whatever the tempest, God did not send that to punish you. He allowed it to draw you to him to get you back on course. He allowed it not because he's angry, but because he what? Because he loves you, and he values you, and he has a plan and a purpose for you, just as he did for Jonah. 
And in every calamity, God has a purpose and a plan. Jonah seemed to forget how God accepted Jacob's and Moses and David's repentance. And thus, he seemed to think the only way to stop the storm was by his death. But praise God, Jonah did not get his wish. As if his life could not get any worse, it just did. And this is what happens to a lot of those who attempt suicide. They think their life can't get any worse. By the way, do you know what percent of people are successful in committing suicide? It's only about 5%. 95% chance as a result of your attempt, your life will actually now get worse. <laughs> and by the way, I think the reason why people are not more successful in this is because God actually is intervening for them not to end their own life in the vast majority of cases. We had a woman come to us. She tried the most severe ways to end her life. Her fourth suicide attempt, she went out into her backyard, did not make a mess. She had started drinking again. Often there's some frontal lobe suppressants on board after she had recovered from alcohol and been off it for six years and things started to go bad in her life and she went back to drinking and then she felt so terrible about herself. She went out in the backyard and she put a gun to her head and she pulled the trigger and the trigger jammed. And she called her boyfriend and her father. They came over there. The boyfriend tried the trigger, pointing it at the ground. And there was nothing wrong with the gun. The bullet went. He can't figure out why she was unable to pull that trigger. She was in a psych institution for a while. And after getting out of the psych institution, She was a nurse, and she had seen someone uh, right in front of her um, attempt to end their life, and it seemed like a pretty painless way, by using a powerful drug that's on a patch and licking it in the mucous membranes, and immediately they keel over and they're dead. She had to do CPR on them. And that's why they revived, because she was an ICU nurse. But she said, this is a pretty good way to do this. So she checked in into a Motel 6, where no one could be around. And she attempted to end her life now for the fifth time, not telling anyone where she was at. And she did go to, to sleep, fell over, was in that same position for three days, to the point where she actually was now having some bed sores from laying in three days in one position, but she wakes up. And fortunately, her mother found out about our program, <laughs> said she's been in psych institutions, she's been everywhere, nothing is helping. Do you think your program could help? I said, I think she's a perfect candidate. (laughs) And she came, and what a difference. She was one who was wanting to end her life every day. Now, at the end of the program, there's a little bit longer story. She wasn't able, she actually did leave in 10 days, but shouldn't have. Because the first week, she was resisting everything in the program. (laughs) She didn't want to be in a religious institution. Her parents didn't tell her that, that this was a religious institution. And as soon as she found out there was religion there, she wanted out. Um, She was booted out of of a a Christian college um, due to a dress code when she was in college and she had um, these grudges in regards to that. And then she was resisting on a lot of other ways, but finally on day seven, without going through the details, 
she decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to at least try this because everyone else is getting better that's trying it. <laughs> and she was only on the three-day program. She wasn't suicidal anymore, so we could discharge her. But I told her, you need, you've only been on the three-day program. You need, you need to spend more time here. And she did give up her tobacco habit, her nicotine habit. She did get on an exercise program. She made a commitment to become a plant-based eater. <clears throat> but she wasn't doing the other things that the Lord wanted her to do in her life, particularly in relationships with men. And so a week later, she calls us and says, can I come back? And we said, sure, we'll take you back. She stayed an extra couple of weeks. And on her second week, she asked the nurse to give her Bible studies. And she just fell in love with everybody that was there. And she says she was loved back to life. I asked her at two weeks, her depression was gone, everything was gone. I said, do you think you're ready to go, go home now? She says, I don't want to say because I want you to tell me because I don't trust myself anymore. And I said, Christy, you are ready to go back. Tears started coming down her eyes. She said, I was hoping you'd say I wasn't, because I want to stay. We did let her stay a few extra days, and she got baptized before she left. And she has turned her life around. And the Lord is blessing her, and she's helping so many people. And so 95% fail because God still wants them to succeed. Maybe the 5% that are successful, he knows that no matter what happens, they're, they're, they're not going to respond to light, maybe. Uh, but uh, anyways, Jonah did not get his wish, and his life got worse. How long did it take him to turn around in the belly of the fish? That's where we get our commitment. In every state in the union, when you're suicidal, you have to be committed for three days. And studies show that even if you don't do anything except isolate for those three days, your suicidal thoughts will actually go away. <laughs> Whether you're put on medicine or not or whatever, you'll come to yourself. You'll become more rational by being put away where you can't do this. And Jonah wasn't rational that first day. He was very upset. <laughs> and he wasn't very rational the second day. But then the third day, he began to turn around and think more rationally. He actually began to accept God's love, and he cried out to the Lord. And like Moses alone in the wilderness, it was when Jonah was alone in the belly of the fish that he really heard God calling out to him in love. And he pled for God's forgiveness. He repented and he committed to doing the will of God. And at that point, the fish vomited Jonah out. Where? On dry land. I think it's probably because Jonah couldn't swim. Because uh, otherwise, the, you know, God would have let him get some exercise. Uh, to help him recover from his depression. But uh, not being able to swim, he just vomited out on dry land. But then he did get light, and he did get exercise. He was just in a rural location. He had to walk to get another ship and to go down to Nineveh. And he became possibly the most effective preacher ever. He turned around an entire wicked city. And he was so effective that God accepted Nineveh's repentance. And he did not destroy Nineveh. Let's fast forward to Jonah chapter 4. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Why did it displease him so much? We're given some insights 
from prophets and kings. Instead of rejoicing, he allowed his mind to dwell upon the possibility of him being regarded as a what? A false prophet. He was well known to be a respected true prophet. Now he thought since God wasn't coming through, he was going to be a false prophet. Jealous of his reputation, he lost sight of the infinitely greater value of the souls in that wretched city. And although he had accepted God's forgiveness for him, it had not transformed his life so that he was willing to completely forgive his enemies that had wronged his people. And some of us have problems with forgiving those that have wronged us or wronged our family members. Forgiveness is recognition that God is stronger than the people who have wounded us. And God is stronger than the past. Choosing to forgive, giving the frustration, anger, and hurt over to God allows us to heal. And a lot of times people think, well, forgiveness is telling people that what they did was not really all that evil, or that it was okay, or that they should just forget it. No, forgiveness is not those things. We don't forgive people for things that they did that were okay. We forgive people for things that they did that were wrong. And it doesn't mean that punishment will not be enacted towards the wrongdoer. If they did wrong, the consequences still should come. Forgiveness Yes, the wrong, for, forgiveness is letting their wrong be their problem and, cho- and not having it be your problem. I choose to trust that even the negative physical, financial, or emotional effects that their wrong choices have had on me will be worked out together for good by God, who is bigger than all that happens in the world. And so we see a lot of people being suicidal as a result of their lack of forgiving spirit towards those who have wronged them. I'm going to skip through. I want to, since we're on this, this aspect of things, yes, I'm going to go into suicide number four in the Bible that has some similarities but also some differences. Suicide number four in the Bible, this gentleman was highly intelligent. In fact, he was one of David's most trusted and wise counselors. And he had an issue on how to deal with someone who has wronged you, who was very powerful and well-liked. David was very powerful. He was also very well-liked by the people. And although Ahithophel was not wrong directly, He was Bathsheba's relative, and he was not at all happy about what David had done to Bathsheba and Uriah. He knew what he did was very wrong. And, you know, this is part of the problem even in regards to Uh, And this is why God can only solve some of these things that even come from the Me Too movement. The girls that were on the stand in front of Congress a few weeks ago were wronged by a person who was well-liked and was one of the most famous doctors in America, the one who took care of the gymnasts. And... They knew what he was doing was wrong. They had complained, but nothing was done about it. And it looked like he was getting by with it. And then years later, often this is the pattern when it comes to abuse. They don't recognize the consequences right away, but years later they recognize it. Often they're even silent about it. And then they recognize how a lot of their issues stem from this. And 
the desire for revenge comes in. Now, David, sin is sin. David's wickedness was not the abuse of young girls, which is a a whole nother level. But what he did was still very wrong. And so Ahithophel had this desire to get revenge. And so when Absalom, who was not near as righteous as David and not after God's own heart and doing a lot of things wrong, when Absalom now starts to get popular, even more popular than David, Ahithophel thinks, this is my opportunity for revenge. And so he comes in and joins Absalom. And, you know, we need to be careful of this. When we have someone that we know or we feel that someone has wronged us, when we start getting on the spirit of revenge, we can end up with even a worse situation and a worse leader and those sorts of things. This is why we, let, we need to let these things be in God's hands. And we need to have that spirit, that willing spirit to forgive and give it over to God. So Ahithophel gave Absalom the wisest counsel. In fact, if Absalom would have followed it, how different the outcome would have been. David might have been eliminated right at that time. But there was another counselor that came in that David sent over, and that counselor appealed to Absalom's carnal nature. And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey, arose, and got him home to his house, to his city, put his household in order, and hanged himself. Recognizing what might come as a result of fortune telling. And also that spirit of lack of forgiveness and really wanting to be wed with God and his will. I'm going to uh, uh, skip down to, uh, there's a lot that we could go over here in regards to uh, those who wanted to die in the Bible and those who were willing to choose death rather than life, including Elijah. Moses was in a situation like this as well. But you might think, you know, I'm in this 89%. I've never even had these thoughts. But if you live long enough with what's coming on the world, thoughts like this are going to be coming your way. Here's what Ellen White says in Prophets and Kings. Into the experience of all, there comes times of keen disappointment and utter discouragement. Days when sorrow is the portion, and it is hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of his earthborn children. Days when troubles harass the soul, till death seems what? preferable to life. It is then that many lose their hold on God and are brought into the slavery of doubt, the bondage of unbelief. Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providence as we should see angels seeking to save us from ourselves, striving to plant our feet upon a foundation more firm than the everlasting hills, and new faith, new life, would spring into being. When that time comes, and if that time comes, and even if some of the bad starts happening as a result of not following the Lord's will, like Jonah or Ahithophel, or I could go into others, Zimri, and uh, some of the other suicides in the Bible, When people are willing to give up on life, instead of giving up on life, all they need to do is give up and put all on the altar their carnal nature. Instead of giving up on life, let's put our desires on the altar of sacrifice and ask God, to fill our lives with his love. He is willing to turn us around. 
He is willing to accept us if we are faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we are willing to repent and turn away. And so the real solution is not giving up on life. It's giving up on our own will and way and submitting our will and way over to God. In a way, I see people that have been suicidal because of the disappointments in life and even the unfairness that has come their way and the choices that they've made is actually being quite close to being converted, as was Christie. Five times attempted suicide, now fully following the Lord's will and seeing the benefits. That story occurred, I think, three years ago. She's gotten promotions. She's gotten more advanced degrees. Her desire is to... Now she's gotten, she's in a nurse practitioner school taking a psych nurse practitioner training so that she can work in depression and anxiety recovery centers and turn other people around as a caregiver and those sorts of things. But she's already doing it all along the way. And God has a plan and purpose for you. When you're ready to give up on life, turn to God in his will and way. But I would encourage you not to just wait until then. You can save yourself a lot of trouble if you decide now to follow God fully and his plan for you. And then you will be willing to die, but not to get out of this life. You will be willing to die to save others. And we have so many examples in Scripture of those who were willing to even lay their own life on the line if someone else could be saved eternally. And what a blessing it is to join Christ in that type of self-sacrificing love for the good of others. I'd like you to open your hymnals for our closing hymn. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. I don't see that you have hymnals here, so I think I might actually have it on the screen. Let's see if I can go forward. Let's see, reconnect, sorry. I should not have closed this down. Here it is, we can sing it off the screen. Shall we stand?
Father in heaven, we thank you that you are interested in every human being turning around. Your desire is that all might come to repentance and follow your will. Because you know that how you've created us, if we submit to your will, we can truly be amazing creatures in you. We pray, Lord, that each one here might be willing to make that decision and to offer that decision of grace to everyone they come in contact with, leading them to the path that leads to your throne and to a life of purpose and value. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.